Today I'm going to be covering a few topics that were um, given to me to talk about. So I'll be talking about the benefits that aquatic habitats have to, um, to us as humans and in ecology we call that ecosystem services. So they provide us with a range of things that are useful in production and in agriculture um, and as humans in our lives. I'll also be talking about what features a functioning stream and wetland have. So streams and wetlands come in all different types of conditions depending on the land management that they've received and I'll be talking about some of the high functioning systems and things we can expect out of those. I'll talk about the importance of farm dams for biodiversity and um, some interesting things that have come out of research in Australia and the effects of different management treatments on properties on farm dams and aquatic systems. So I'll start by putting the situation into context. Our human population growth is shown on this graph. We have time on the x-axis. And of course, it has um, been rapidly increasing. So my gran was born around here, um, just before the end of Second World War. I was in high school somewhere here, where there were six billion people in the world. We're already at 7.7 .7 billion, and this is expected to keep increasing for at least the next 30 years at a rapid rate. And of course we've seen huge changes come with this increase in human population growth. Uh, we've seen amazing technologies, we've seen pandemics, and with this, this growth we've had to use agriculture to sustain us as human beings. And so the amount of agriculture that we need and are going to need in the future is also increasing with this human population growth. And agriculture is by far the largest consumer of fresh water globally. So the figures change slightly depending on the location or the situation, but are generally somewhere between 60 and 70% of fresh water going towards agriculture. In Australia, it is our single largest land use. More than 60% of Australia is taken up um, for agriculture to sustain us. And in farm dams specifically, there is over 8,000 gigalitres of water stored in farm dams throughout Australia. And it's actually hard to really estimate how many farm dams we have exactly because they're small water bodies, um, but the estimates put us anywhere between 2 million and 5 million. So there's a lot of water stored in some really small little dams and then more water stored in some larger dams throughout Australia. So the management of those systems is really important. And freshwater systems um, have responded um, to this change. Um, water on cattle properties in New South Wales varies dramatically. So um, studies that have been done in New South Wales specifically have found a giant range in how much water these properties use. It ranges um, between 3.3 to 201 litres of water um, direct consumption equivalent. So for each kilogram of live weight of yearling cattle produced, it exerts a pressure on freshwater resources equivalent to the direct consumption of somewhere between 3.3 and over 200 litres of water, depending on that property in New South Wales. So a giant range in how much water is used on different properties. Um, the use of this water has had influences on the wetlands, so globally over half of wetlands have been lost since the early 1800s. And um, this is important because uh, freshwater species have declined with this. So another graph that shows a decreasing trend this time rather than an increasing trend. So we have time again on the x-axis, but rather than it going up with human population growth, it's going down. Um, and it's got confidence intervals around that. So this is the average and it's gone down somewhere between these gaps. So this graph is showing that when scientists looked at over 800 freshwater species 
at their population um, abundances, but somewhere between 68 to 89% of the, those populations had declined. So there is a, a global trend for freshwater species to be negatively affected, for populations to be declining, some species going extinct in response to increasing land pressures. So regulating our rivers, extracting uh, water out of the systems and the loss of those wetlands. These freshwater systems are particularly susceptible for a few reasons. Um, one of them is that they have high endemism, which means that there are lots of species that occur in freshwater systems that have small ranges and are unique to that system. So you might have a fish that occurs only in one lake or a turtle that occurs only in one river, like the Bellinger River turtle. And they have very high connectivity. So something that you do at the top of a river is going to affect what happens at the bottom of that river. It's going to flow down. That system is very connected. Something that you do in the landscape on your property is going to affect the farm dam that captures that water further down. Of course, freshwater is really important, not just to freshwater species, but to us as humans. And so we've concentrated a lot of our development in agriculture around these systems. We've extracted from them, regulated them to try and control them for that water security. Um, and in some cases, for some species, there's been direct harvest. So you will have heard of different fish, um, fisheries that have crashed because of too much harvest of that certain species. So what if they go extinct? Who cares if we lose a species of frog from the environment? This is a question that I get a lot and I think it's a really good question. I think no ecologist would argue that losing any one species of frog will necessarily have huge consequences. If we lose simply one frog from the whole range of frog species, who's to say that we'll even notice that it's gone? There are some animals when you'll notice when they have top-down effects, if they're big predators and so forth, but for many species they could slip away and we wouldn't even notice. But we need to remember that these animals have important roles in the ecosystem. So frogs, when they're adults as frogs, they eat bugs. Uh, as juveniles, tadpoles, they are an aquatic species and so they will graze on algae. And when you put that into context of production and you look at the abundance of frogs, they're very, very abundant, very dense. It was found on just three rice farms in southern New South Wales that frogs were consuming around 220 million rice pests in less than a year. From just spring to autumn, they were responsible for this massive element of pest control. So they looked at how many bugs the frogs were eating, they counted how many frogs there were in the different area, they looked at what proportion of the bugs the frogs were eating were pests and they could figure out that there were a ton of pests being eaten by these frogs. Um, frogs are also food for a bunch of other animals. So bats eat frogs, birds eat frogs, fish, goannas, turtles, there's lots of different animals that rely on frogs or whatever animal we're talking about will be eaten by a bunch of other animals and those animals will have a bunch of jobs. So they might be food, we like to eat fish, we like to eat duck. They might be pollinators, birds, bats, really important pollinators in agricultural systems. They might be ecosystem engineers such as bandicoots that uh, will dig up the soil and disperse fungi and other important um, other important biota throughout the system. We might like them for recreation like bird watching or fishing and some production enterprises have been able to merge those recreational uses of the wildlife uh, with their production systems quite successfully or they might be cleaning the water. So turtles in particular, um, certain fish that will eat carrion out of the water will help to decrease um, that carrion, that breaking down organic matter and um, they'll have important implications for water quality. So whilst losing a single species might not be a big deal, uh, we can have death of a thousand cuts if we start to lose lots of different species that have all of these different roles in the ecosystem and with them we start to lose all these benefits that we get out of having them there. Some of the benefits we might not even know about. 
So there's broader benefits um, of functioning streams and wetlands. Of course, the primary one is for water storage. And in New South Wales, um, studies that have looked at where our dams are used, um, most of them are for watering stock, 53%, a lot for irrigation, and then some for some other uses, um, erosion control, aesthetics, firefighting, etc. So they have this primary function um, that's very useful to us and in, within that water storage capacity they can also help to reduce floods. They will obviously collect water that is running off um, the properties and that can help people to overcome droughts where they have water stored uh, during those drier times. A functioning stream or wetland will also help to improve the water quality and we can think about uh, wastewater quality plants that use plants really effectively to do this, use different types of vegetation to do this. So some examples that I pulled out of the literature are um, typha and phragmites which are common plant species that we have all over Australia, common wetland plants. This is typha here, this um, kumbudgee or bulrush will help to reduce nitrogen, will help to reduce phosphorus, um, phosphate sorry, from the water and so they will help to reduce excess nutrients which if they were left in there would go on to potentially cause algal blooms if we have too many nutrients in our water. So our vegetation can actually help us to, to reduce those algal blooms. Um, they can remove metals from wastewater, um, a range of different metals, but Phragmites will reduce zinc, for example. And of course, they will produce oxygen in the same way that plants do. So in wetland plants, the plant root is a major source of the oxygen in wetlands. So some really important and nifty things that will happen if we have certain plants in our wetlands that won't happen if we have an empty dam um, that's damaged and won't allow plants to grow. So other benefits of a functioning stream and wetland, when we have intact habitat, when we have that vegetation growth, we're also going to see increased soil organic matter, we're going to have growth of vegetation that's going to retain moisture in our system and in our wetland increase the retention of that moisture. Um, that organic matter is important for biological activity uh, which will help production and for storage of carbon. Moving out slightly to the landscape level, shade um, and having trees at the broader landscape level will also help to regulate climate. So studies in southern Queensland found that these vegetation bands resulted in maximum temperatures that were up to 2.6 degrees cooler and minimum temperatures that were up to 9.5. 0.95 degrees Celsius warmer. So basically insulating our landscape um, and helping us to regulate that climate, uh, reduce the really cold and the really hot days, which is then going to help not just with production, but help the plants um, as well. They're also really important nesting material um, and habitat for every level of the food chain. So from the macroinvertebrates that will live inside the vegetation in, in the pond or in the dam, right out to the birds that nest with it, um, and then other things that will use the trees, the hollows for their habitat. The plant, the animals themselves also have important roles. So in ecology, we often categorize the different in, insects that are inside the water based on their job, their role. So some of them are grazers, things like snails will graze the algae. Uh, some of them will run around collecting up little bits of um, detritus and so forth and we call them collectors, things like shrimp and crustaceans. And then we have filter feeders. So um, in streams, particularly where the flow of water, we'll see animals that have nets that can capture in their nets uh, nutrients as they're going past. And so all these different mix of animals doing these different jobs are helping to consume and use up the resources that are in there and then provide food for the other animals there. Turtles are an interesting resource in the landscape. It's estimated that in the Murray River they'll consume over 130 tonnes per day of carrion during summer, which is the season in which they're most active. 
So if we took turtles out of the river system, we would have this buildup of carrion um, and that would be reducing the water quality uh, in a way that would be unfavourable. So they're playing an important role. We've talked about predators and prey, um, frogs as predators and um, also as prey. And different roles that animals might have might be pollination, dispersal of plants, recreation, um, and so forth. So lots of different benefits happening of our animals in these systems. So if we want to know whether our aquatic system is functioning, whether our dam, our stream, our wetland on our property is functioning, how might we go about looking at that? The government has uh, put together a resource, it's been around for a long time, called the Australian and New Zealand Guidelines for Fresh and Marine Water Quality, which you can access on a website and details, approaches and advice on different properties of water quality, different guideline values. So you can look on this um, and see what is recommended by the government as clean drinking water. As an exercise of doing this, before I recommended it to anyone, I did this and I found the livestock drinking water quality section and followed this link and it took me to an empty table. Um, I also looked at the irrigation for water for general on-farm use and it took me to some guidelines from 20 years ago. So it's a work in progress, this website, um, but it will give you some values if you go to the interactive section. It can tell you what some default guideline values are for various metals and what you might, um, some, some high values that you might want to avoid. But it really stresses the importance of knowing the baseline values for your region. So some regions will be naturally higher in certain elements and if you don't know the background behind that, if you don't know why, it will be influenced by the geology, it will be influenced by past land management practices, um, then a single value in isolation might not be uh, particularly useful. So it's important to talk to your local LLS, talk to um, people who might have past data or track that over time and look at how it's changing in response to the past. There are also some published studies on what you might expect in Australian farm dams and the variability in these systems is huge. So this paper um, had a table that that summarised uh, values that were found in various studies. And you can see even, for example, total phosphorus, that the variation between 10 and 2,800 in these farm dams was huge. And so this will depend on the source of water, the past um, management practices, the geology of the area, a range of different um, Influences will determine what these, these values are and because there is such a large variability, um, looking at it in isolation can be confusing and uninformative. But there are some general trends that we can pull out. So turbidity, when we have uh, lots of sediment in our water, will limit light penetration. So the light won't be able to go through, which means that plants will not be able to, um, to extract oxygen from under the water. If we have high cyanobacteria, so blue-green algae is a type of cyanobacteria, that density can shade out macrophytes, which are other plants in the system. So we can have a dominance of something that we don't want in certain areas, and these would be unfavourable. Uh, we can get eutrophic systems, so systems that have too many nutrients and they will cause algal blooms. Um, once we have an algal bloom, it will start uh, respiring and using up the dissolved oxygen and so we can have fish kills um, because we're losing the oxygen out of our system. And when they die, they also can release toxins that are really harmful to both humans and livestock. So avoiding interactions that result in these things uh, is going to lead to healthier farm dams and aquatic systems. In the same way, bare edges that don't have vegetation around them are going to be vulnerable to erosion, to evaporation, because there's nothing shading them and there's nothing holding them in place. So when we have storms, when we have disturbance from livestock, it's going to release those and move them around and then cause turbidity.
So looking at what we want to have in a healthy aquatic system, um, lots of studies have found that emergent vegetation, vegetation that's emerging out of the water at the margin, will be correlated or it will increase the number of frogs, um, frog species, frog abundance, and macroinvertebrates. So those bugs, the filter feeders, the grazers, the collectors in our pond, dam, wetland system. So this is showing that in a graphical form where they had macrophyte cover, so the amount of plant cover in their wetland, and as the plant cover goes up, so does the richness, so the number of invertebrate families. So lots of different bugs playing lots of different roles as they have vegetation to live in. Scientists have also found that native canopy cover in the surrounding landscape is really important. So it's not just your property that's going to influence what's on it, it is the surrounding landscape. If you have a national park next to you, if you have um, someone who has uh, left native vegetation or regenerated native vegetation, then that is going to interact with what is around it to bring benefits. And so frogs respond to that, birds will respond to that, lots of different wildlife will respond to having things in the mosaic of the landscape. Platypus, fish, birds will all use um, aquatic systems if they have certain features, things like woody debris uh, to provide habitat, that vegetation, um, fish need um, complexity in the water so they need debris, things like fallen logs um, and vegetation to nest, as do many frogs that will use the vegetation to attach their eggs to. Birds will obviously use the vegetation for nesting material. So if we don't have um, that building block of the vegetation, then we won't have a lot of the species that will rely on it for parts of their life cycle. In other countries, there's been research that shows that rare aquatic plants and dragonflies in Japan, um, particularly through Europe, there are many rare and endangered species that will use um, aquatic ecosystems like farm dams, so they're particularly important. Your farm dam in Australia, you can expect anywhere between zero to seven frog species. And if you're interested in knowing how many frog species you've got in your farm dam, you can download an app from, from the internet, from the app store on your phone, and you can simply take a recording of a frog when it's calling, and it will send you back an identification of that frog. And so if you're interested in knowing perhaps um, how many species your dam supporting and whether you've got species that are going to be eating um, pest bugs, then you can look at this quite easily yourself. This is an Australian Museum um, initiative that allows people to kind of do that monitoring themselves. So I was asked to talk about how important farm dams are for aquatic life. And I would say that in other countries, they're especially important, particularly Europe and um, England, where, where they've lost um, so many of their natural wetlands. We've also lost a lot of our natural wetlands in Australia, but it's important to put it in historical context. So in the tablelands, historically our runoff was captured in the headwaters of the Darling River. So in the um, Guida and Namoy, it would flow down to the Barwon and eventually into the Darling. Um, farm dams, by virtue of their function to capture water, are preventing that water from ending up in those, in those streams. So we're extracting that water for our purposes. And so it's important to recognise that whilst they will also support aquatic life, they're also preventing a different type of aquatic life. So naturally it would have been um, that water would have ended up in the stream and stream animals would have relied on that. And now we have a series of um, ponds in the landscape. So I would advocate for farm dams are here. We, we're not gonna change that. And so the farm dams that we have, we should look after uh, in the best way possible. And farm dams do support aquatic life, absolutely. Um, so even though a freshwater body might be small, it still uh, can be particularly important to, to maintaining species. Um, studies have found that uh, farm dams will support a similar abundance and um, 
species of frogs and bugs between natural wetlands and farm dams. Um, and this is even being used in other countries as a as a conservation strategy to create these hotspots of diversity. So undeniably having these freshwater havens in the landscape is useful for plants and animals that use that landscape. Things like bats um, that are important uh, in dispersal and pest control in agricultural systems can't go more than um, more than a certain distance from dams in the same way that cattle can't. And so when we have them in the landscape, it allows these animals to come in and inhabit these regions. The current advice for fauna in farm dams is having a um, healthy native riparian zone. So that zone of of vegetation around the wetland is important at providing habitat. It will reduce erosion. Um, the roots of those plants will help to hold the soil in place and will help to filter the water as it comes down the catchment. The woody debris that is in these systems provide platypus, fish and bug habitat, so it allows more species to inhabit these regions. It's important to recognise that yabby traps, uh, crab pots, anything that is submerged in the water that's there to catch uh, fish or, or yabbies is also going to potentially catch platypus and turtles. And so um, avoiding traps um, or keeping them submerged or checking them regularly are important um, to avoid drowning platypus and turtles. And having shade elsewhere in the paddock will mean that um, livestock don't need to come into the dam just to cool off necessarily. So that's important. What practices can farmers undertake to minimise the impact of their activities on aquatic life? I think um, reducing the direct access to dams or to aquatic areas can be really beneficial. And every property is different. You will know if you are experiencing damage to that freshwater system, that will be obvious because you'll have soil that is broken up, you'll have a lack of vegetation, um, structurally unsound banks. And so fencing that area off will be a, a physical strategy to prevent livestock from damaging it. We'll hear about troughs today and they can be particularly useful because often livestock will choose to access the trough over going directly into the water, particularly if there's shade available in the rest of the paddock. Um, so even if you didn't have a fence, simply having a trough uh, could be a measure to deter livestock from going directly into the water. Using uh, phosphate that is low in solubility can help to reduce those algal blooms. Reducing runoff by having vegetation, by having ground cover, by having um, emergent vegetation in your water bodies can be really useful and will also help provide resilient banks um, through vegetation and that woody debris. So all of those things are going to help create this ecological system with these interactions of different animals doing different jobs. Why would you even bother the production benefits of doing this? Uh, there is research, some research into this. So water that is aerated or coagulated improved steer weight gain um, compared to untreated water from a dugout. So this was in Canada in three out of five years. And in this case, the study showed that there was a nine to 10% increase in weight gain over 90 days with water that was aerated then pumped to a trough. So they saw almost 10% increase over three months in their cattle when they had that clean water. That effect was quite clear. Um, similarly, yearling heifers that access clean water are gaining 23% more weight than those directly accessing the pond. And uh, this study showed that cattle avoided water that was contaminated with fresh manure, so um, cattle that could access the water and um, defecate and urinate in it um, were, was less palatable than clean water. And cattle that had access to clean water spent more time grazing and less time resting than those that directly accessed the pond. So essentially you can increase how much weight your cattle put on, how much um, food they eat by making sure they have access to clean water. There's some other um, production benefits to maintaining these healthy aquatic systems um, in water retention. We can increase water retention by making sure there's tall vegetation, 
um, that reduces wind, which causes evaporation, um, and also cools down the water body and reduces stratification. So when you have a water body where it's cold at the bottom and hot at the top, there's layering, thermal layering of that water. When that water remixes, um, it can really reduce the water quality because um, of the processes that are happening at the bottom of that water. So if we mix that, um, we can avoid those negative effects. We talked about emergent vegetation helping to reduce excess nutrients, excess metals, providing habitat, storing carbon and recycling nutrients, and then providing habitat for animals that also help to do the same. And of course the benefits of pest control that come with supporting those animals. So what is the effect of different management practices? Um, I think if we look at fencing and having a trough, then the the wetland system has complete protection from livestock and that will encourage that vegetation growth. There won't be the trampling and the pugging. The trough will have partial protection, so it might reduce the trampling and pugging and fecal input, but it might not completely protect it. And then without direct access, it's likely um, to, to be trampled, to have pugging and to have that fecal input, which reduces the water quality through those different processes. In a system where we do have algal blooms, um, they can be treated through algicides and um, through some interesting techniques that they use in water quality treatment plants where they use floating islands um, that support aquatic plants and those plants will then help to remove those excess nutrients. And so that can be um, made up through um, PVC pipe or plastic bottles or bamboo um, and help to reduce those algal blooms and that way you can introduce plants into your system. Reducing evaporation has been um, looked at through using alcohols as a chemical method, using physical covers which is possible in some smaller dams um, and particularly with trees that reduce the wind and provide the shade can be really useful. And then reducing sedimentation and erosion, which is going to lead to water quality problems, can be done through that solid riparian zone, that vegetation um, in our catchment um, throughout, the, throughout the runoff zone and also the wetland. So I was asked whether simply increasing dam oxygenation by a pump is useful. And I would say possibly because it's going to increase the dissolved oxygen in that wetland and it's going to mix that stratified or prevent mixing of stratified bodies, so those thermal layers. So it might be a solution that's useful depending on the problems that you're facing on your property, but it is going to fail to address other problems such as the pugging and the trampling caused by the livestock, um, excess sedimentation that might be coming in if there's not vegetation zones to protect that sediment. Um, the vegetation's still going to get damaged if there's direct um, access by livestock and um, the filtration benefits that come with vegetation. So depending on what the problem is, increasing dissolved oxygen may be useful, but it's probably not going to address a lot of the problems on properties. So if you are reticulating water uh, from a wetland, from a dam, um, from, the, from a stream up into a trough, uh, you still need to provide all of the usual uh, necessary aspects for the livestock, so they need shade and shelter from the wind, obviously feed and um, need to make sure you've got a water supply. And there's various technology out there now to help uh, ensure and, and monitor these different aspects. I was asked to talk about the economic case for management change. Can we quantify these production values of good quality water? And I think the answer is that in Australia, we don't have a, um, a definitive answer on that yet. Uh, we have some indicative studies from overseas that show these benefits for water quality, and we can certainly talk about some of the, the benefits, the ecosystem services that come out of uh, having um, different wildlife, different plants and animals in agricultural systems and certainly some work has been done on putting a dollar value on those things uh, but the actual uh, dollar value of the amount that the livestock will increase in weight gain um, versus the the 
quality of the water, I don't have a specific figure. Um, I will be doing research over the next three years in the tablelands, looking at um, looking at that question, looking at what those trade-offs are. And so, if anyone has a farm dam or a stream on their property, a wetland, and they're interested in having that monitored over time, um, please get in contact with me. Um, I'd love to come and check out your property and um, talk more about water quality on the tablelands. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed for that, Deborah. I really enjoyed that and uh, loved that picture of the bulrushes. It just took me back to when we used to have the dams and the, the little streams at home back in, in England. Which raised for me a really interesting point because you, you talked about tall plants at one stage and, and my mind was going through, are we talking about tall plants in the, the water or tall plants outside, apropos of that little diagram. And with that, how close to the dam should your fencing be for maximum effect? Yep. So um, it doesn't have to be particularly far away. Uh, just a few meters from the dam can still allow the the vegetation to build up. Um, as long as you have you know a few meter buffer around your dam, that's going to provide um, benefits enough for the emergent vegetation in the dam to to grow, to establish, um, and prevent the cattle from directly accessing that dam. So I don't think you have to lose a lot of productive land to fence that dam. Um, just as long as it's a few meters from the edge. Thank you. And, and the other thing is, if you've got bulrushes in, one of my jobs as a kid was having to clean it, clean it all out every once in a while, it seemed like every year. And then there's the concern of the roots of timber going into dams, weakening it, etc. Any thoughts on that, please? Yep. It will certainly depend on your dam, on your property, as to what is going to be um, useful and going to be um, optimal. Um, certainly there is an invasive species of typha in Australia which uh, we don't want to start planting and putting around. There are also two native species. Um, but monitoring your dam, if it's getting clogged up from the wetland weeds, then that's obviously going to be problematic. Um, but in many cases, other, other wetland plants will establish and will compete with them. Birds will bring in lots of different seeds as well and help maintain that seed bank. Plants like Iliacaris reeds um, and Balbus are really um, useful. Um, so, sorry, Baumia. So it will depend on your system and obviously if you have um, if you have a cap on your dam and you, and you don't want roots going into that, then that's going to be a consideration in the vegetation that you try and establish around that around that dam. So you offered our viewers a chance to contact you for monitoring etc and working along with LNS mm -hmm. and yourself we can hopefully improve some of that yep. situation. That would be great over the next few years. Yes, I'd be really keen to work with local landholders to see what we can do. Great stuff. Deb Bauer, thank you so much. That was really great. Really Thanks, enjoyed it. Enjoyed. Bye.